Debbie, I think this is a different visual too than you. Than yeah, the I'm in the times. office today. I'm not <laughs> in my home office. I know my my um, research um, team for my BHI ambassadorship is um, visiting. One's from Sweden and one is from the UK. So they came in to spend the week, which is so nice to be in a room together. So I'm in the office. Yeah, I did notice that. I, I am going in later today. It's not like I never go in, but. For me, it's always 9 a.m. And so yeah. it's not a time, you know, I'll be in later in the afternoon. But and for you, Nick, it's a quick bike ride, I think. Like you back and forth <laughs> pretty regularly. Yeah, it is. It's very odd, actually. I have two things. One is a lunch and one meeting someone for coffee. And then both of them are just going to bike and do it and come back. Because uh, tomorrow I spend most of the day in the office. Tomorrow I have, uh, it, it depends on stuff. But yeah, it is very close by. And do you teach? Yeah, I teach Monday, Wednesday. So I have, right, right now, four hours of teaching monday four hours wednesday so i just had yesterday morning was, and what uh, is your course what are you who and what are you teaching uh i have an undergrad course that's first uh equal equal 149 it's about man it's basically management practices in fact this week was fun because it's capped at 40 i split the class into two groups of 20 and i do this game around lean manufacturing a game that i did when i was at mckinsey actually i bought the sets so they wow. have to create a mini factory, have all the equipment. Yeah, we do that too. I love it. It's great. And then the graduate class is what's called labor economics, but kind of very much future of work. So in fact, yes, they went through a fascinating paper on um, the impact of management on firm performance using effectively what was a big experiment in post-World War II with the Marshall Plan, where the Americans mm. helped thousands of Italian firms. Thousands of Italian firms applied for management support. And then somewhat randomly, only about half of them got it. So you have a perfect treatment and control and you can look at what happens. Wow. Hey, I'm coming out to the West Coast in a couple of weeks. Um, so maybe we could get together. That would be great. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll look up the details and then send it to you. I would love to see you. Yeah. Thanks, Libby. And I think you've got New York travel before terribly long, Nick. I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I have a stat. In fact, we should pin stuff. I'm in New York twice pretty shortly actually uh so yeah in fact rob separately we should align diaries to make sure that the worst thing is i'm here i'm like oh no i'm you know off to uh you know pluto or something on that and that two weeks no worries all right for folks that are listening in, we'll probably give one more minute and then we'll uh we'll go ahead and get started how much space travel do you have coming up in fact rob <laughs> a lot of space travel most, most of my travel is space travel okay at least it feels that way in the middle of, uh, Nick, you know this, and Debbie and I have talked about this recently, but we've got a, a near five-month-old that we've been sleep training with intermittent success. And so depending on how well he's sleeping is whether I feel like I'm on this planet or a different planet, or, you know, it, it varies quite a bit. In there. It Interesting about return to office, campus is totally back. Like, you know, there are certain activities that are all teaching. I, I'm not sure there's any teaching anymore at least at Stanford, that's online that can be done in person. There probably is some, but although the, the classes are recorded, some of the undergrads prefer to watch the recording later. In fact, if you remember one of the episodes of Harry Potter has Hermione going to like time yeah. travel. <laughs> yeah, 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 so some of the undergrads effectively now, what they're doing is they're doing courses that are kind of overlapping because they just want to do both. And then they just watch one on the video and one they go and play. It's not really ideal though, because you never really get to meet your, you know, classmates in that setup but it does happen yeah all right well why don't we go ahead and get started thank you everybody who is joining us today i am very excited this is the third version or third edition i guess of state of flex we started doing it in i think august was our first one if i recall correctly we did one in august and then we did one in november and so this is number three uh, i'm joined by two luminaries and people that i deeply respect on flexible work nick bloom and debbie lovich and so thank you very much for for joining me today uh, a couple of notes uh, on programming and how this works for folks that maybe haven't joined us before. We do about half the time presentation. So each of us will speak for roughly five to seven minutes. We'll share four of our favorite slides, mostly data oriented around work that we've been doing and things that we think are particularly interesting uh, in trends on office and remote work and flexible work. Um, afterward, the other half will be entirely Q&A. Um, and so we'll make sure that we cover a range of questions, I'll kind of moderate a little bit and feed some stuff to Nick, feed some stuff to Debbie, answer some stuff directly. Um, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion. A couple things to note. If you look at the bottom of the Zoom, you should see the Q&A in the chat. Um, it should be at the bottom or not in the chat, rather in the uh, the bar. So you can see an option for Q&A. 
feel free to type in any question that's on your mind. People can thumbs up the different questions um, and that will help us actually rank a little bit and make sure that we talk about things that people are really interested in. And so please feel free to not only write in questions, um, but also give feedback on things that are interesting to you. Um, and you can also answer questions or write in comments directly in the Q&A as well to answer each other's questions. One of the things that's been fun in past states of states of flex, if I got the plural right, is uh, not only do we answer and discuss stuff live, but there's a vibrant conversation happening in the Q&A also where people are answering each other's pieces and that allows for us to cover more ground. Um, so feel, please feel free to be as active as you want there and we'll try to cover as much as we can. Rob, can I ask you a question, actually, which is, Please, I think you post the slides. Is that right? Is that OK with everyone with Debbie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, so we'll do I... a couple of things. One, we'll, we'll, we'll send out a recording afterward. And so everybody uh, will we'll post it on the Flex Index site. Um, we'll also send out a link in our next uh, newsletter. Uh, and we'll send a link to slides as well. So if people want them for whatever purpose, they've got them. Thanks. This is about spreading the word. There you go. <laughs> Um, Nick, Debbie, anything I missed before we dig in? Are we good? All right. Um, then we will kick off. Um, all right. So um, I'll start and then Debbie will go next and then Nick will wrap it up. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Scoop. We build software to help teams that are hybrid predominantly better coordinate around time in the office and coordinate around their synchronous workflow around meetings. Uh, we create the Flex Index. The Flex Index has grown uh, pretty dramatically over the last 12 months. It, we just had a, a Flex Index on their birthday, actually, which is pretty cool. Uh, but now it's got 8,000 plus companies. Uh, those companies have more than 60,000 offices in the US. They have a bunch more abroad. Those companies employ more than 100 million people globally. So it's become a pretty big data set. I also do a podcast uh, called Flex Perspectives, where we have some great folks talk about uh, their personal experiences and company experiences and research around flexible work. All right. So first slide, I talk a little bit about state of flexibility in the US. So a couple of things that I think are really interesting. One, we've been tracking this each quarter since we did our first flex report or first quarterly flex report uh, in February 2023. So if you look at the data, what you're seeing here is three different types of office requirements. We broadly bucket them into what we call fully flexible. Fully flexible means that the company either doesn't have offices at all and everyone works fully remotely, or the company does have offices, but employees are not required to go into them. So first bucket is fully flexible. Second is structured hybrid, which means that the company has offices and there is some set expectation on time spent in office, could be a minimum percentage of the time, a minimum number of days, specific days. Um, it's not full-time, but it's some portion of the time. And then the third is full-time in office where the expectation is you know, five days a week or more are spent in the office. The big trend over the last five quarters is two things. One, if you look at the right, pretty meaningful shift away from full-time in office. Back in Q1 2023, it was pretty neck and neck. 49% of companies in the U.S. on an industry-weighted basis uh, required full-time in office. 51% offered some level of work location flexibility. A year later, that 49% number has dropped to 35%. So a 14% a percentage point change in full-time in office uh, across the U.S. The big beneficiary or kind of gaming model in that has been structured hybrid, which has grown from 20% of firms to 32% of firms now on an industry-weighted basis uh, across the U.S. Um, and the big adjustment there really in particular has happened to be at uh, larger companies. So the companies that are bigger from an employment perspective are the ones that have disproportionately kind of like embraced structured hybrid models. All right, next slide. So one of the more interesting things that we looked at and we did for the first time in partnership with Debbie and Boston Consulting Group is we looked a little bit at culture and specifically uh, not just culture, but employee sentiment and how do employees feel about their company. The way we did this is we looked at Glassdoor ratings. And so uh, we looked at 554 public companies that we had flexibility data on on Flex Index. Uh, Debbie and the BCG team pulled I believe it was almost 450,000. Is that right, Debbie? I think 450,000 data points on Glassdoor. Yep. 447,635. All right. So 447,635, specific number. Uh, and we looked at you know, what were the trends? Are there any differences in employee sentiment in different types of companies? This is one of the more interesting things we found. Um, it's probably not super surprising that employees at fully flexible companies rated work-life balance 
higher than structured hybrid, structured hybrid higher than full-time in office. The culture and values one was a pretty interesting one, though, um, in particular because there's a lot of executives who say, well, culture could only be built in the office and we can only form true relationships when we're in the office. Um, and I personally believe that there's a real value in being together and the opportunity to build relationships in person. Um, I think that's true, not just um, for full-time and office models, but in structured hybrid and fully flexible, um, even fully remote organizations make a real point of getting together in person. But when you ask employees to rate their culture, interestingly enough, fully flexible and structured hybrid do better. Full-time and office have the lowest scores uh, in terms of the perception of their company's culture. Uh, so this is pretty interesting to us in that it's a, it's a shift from the common dialogue around this. Uh, culture obviously can be built in lots of different models, and full-time and office does not score higher than, than other types of flexibility. And hey, Rob, there's a question in the uh, Q&A about... Um, just the categorization that may be worth elaborating on in terms of, um, you know, when the leader led or the team comes up with it, and I'll talk about that a little bit in, in our analysis, but where would you put that between, where do we put that between fully flexible and structured hybrid? Great question. Uh, so fully flexible, or I'll start with the structured hybrid side of it. Structured hybrid is most commonly company dictated, um, at least in terms of the guardrails around it. So the, the analogy I use, and maybe it's a poor one, but typically I think of as you know, think about structured hybrid is the company sets the bumper rails, like if you were bowling, um, and then teams quite often can find their way within that. So a company might say, you know, minimum two days a week in the office, and the team will say, okay, well, one team will be Monday and Wednesday, another team might give flexibility on those two days. It gets customized a little bit more locally, so to speak, based on the needs and workflow and patterns of that team. Fully flexible is typically a company-wide designation, which says, as a company, we do not require employees to come into the office. Doesn't mean they never come in. You know, They might get together as a team once a month or once a quarter, or a team might decide they come in two or three days a week. Um, but it's that flexibility is kind of given um, at the employee level to choose, you know, in terms of whether they go into the office or not. One other point on this, and I think there was a, a question around um, size of companies. These are big companies. So public company, I think the average em uh, employee count for these companies is tens of thousands of employees. Um, so specifically, this is a public data set uh, for large companies. So moving to the next one, and we'll add into, we'll dig into more of this stuff in Q&A too, and, and can go as deep as folks would like. Um, one of the areas that we looked at, which we thought was particularly interesting, was career opportunities and how do employees uh, think about their career opportunities versus is it fully flexible, is it structured hybrid, is it full-time in office? Um, and this was one dimension where structured hybrid scored highest. Um, and, and to me personally, it wasn't surprising in the sense that you know it creates an opportunity for employees to spend uh, part of the time per week in office, building relationships, exposed to executives, opportunities for mentorship around that. At the same time, they spend part of the week um, at home where they can focus in quiet, deep thinking, and that's a good balance for folks from a career opportunities perspective. Again, both structured hybrid and fully flexible were rated better than full-time in office for career, but I thought that was an important note around structured hybrid and some of the benefits of that balance. And then the last one I'll add was uh, we were really curious to understand if there's any relationship between company size and whether employee sentiment varied between fully flexible and structured hybrid models. Um, and what we found was, and if you look at this chart, the x-axis is total company employees. So on the far left is less than 10,000. On the far right are big companies, 150,000 plus. We looked for each size range. Is there a difference in sentiment you know, for companies that are fully flexible versus structured hybrid? And it looked like there was a bit of a transition point where at about 20,000 employees, that's where employees started to appreciate maybe more of the structure. It could be because organizations of that size are more complex and more multifaceted and multinational. And so um, having some of that structure around it actually started to score in line or better versus fully flexible. Anything smaller than that, fully flexible actually scored more highly than structured hybrid. Um, so point being here, there's not a perfect answer on flexibility. Fully flexible may be right for some organizations. Structured hybrid may be right for others. Um, employees view it differently a little bit based on size and different dimensions. Um, consistently, though, fully flexible and structured hybrid across all dimensions scored better than full-time in office. All right. That's all I got. I'll pass it to Debbie. Great. Thank you. Um, 
So yes, I'm, I've been at BCG, it's coming up on 30 years. And since COVID hit, I lead our thinking on uh, what I call making work work. I also have the privilege of being a BCG Henderson Institute fellow, which is our internal think tank. So I get to spend a quarter of my time really thinking about interesting things for me, where, where is work going? Um, we just put out, and this is why we could share the slides, we just put out a report this week um, if you flip ahead, I'll show you some of the data from the report. And these are from, you know, what we call office workers. Um, I don't like white collar or knowledge workers. So I call them office or desk-based workers and frontline or deskless workers. So this is on an office worker population. And we just asked, this is from the fall, said, are you looking for a new job? Um, either actively or passively. Actively means I'm looking for a new job. Passively means if I got a phone call, I'd take the call and consider taking the job. And um, not looking for a job is I wouldn't even take the call. And you could see, you know, a large number of people, despite all the, you know, layoffs or whatever announcements, are still quite open um, to looking for a new job. And if you flip to the next page, um, we then ask people two questions about their job. We said, do you enjoy work? Yes or no? High or low? Right? Um, and are you effective at your job? Effective meaning you know, productive and quality, right? Are you getting amount of work done in the needed amount of time? And the um, the percentage in the box is the percent that's looking for a new job. And you see not, well, I think a bit surprisingly, right? You go from I'm not effective to I'm effective. The attrition numbers or the risk of attrition go down, you know, maybe five points, um, but not really material. Um, and not surprisingly, if you go from low enjoyment of work to high enjoyment of work, the attrition numbers go down if you enjoy work. Totally makes sense. If I enjoy my job, I'm less likely to quit. I think what's surprising to us is that 50% reduction, right? Or you're half as likely to quit or you know, twice as likely to stay if you enjoy work. And the reason this is so important as you think about like all the work we do, we're a consulting firm, right? Or anything that comes at the top of a firm, you know, to drive down into an organization. It's about productivity. It's about cost out. It's about efficiency. It's about innovation. But you don't actually think about in doing that work of the work. Well, do your employees enjoy their work? Okay, so what does that have to do with state of flex? Well, we use this analysis on the next page to sort of put to bed the same question that Rob was pointing to. So let me explain what's here, because this is, as they say, an eye chart. Um, you know, we ask people not overall how much they like their work, but we also ask them to break it down by task. So you could see they have focus work, interactive work, administrative work, overseeing work. And we said for each of those types of work, um, we asked them how much time you spend on that. Actually look at your calendar last week, right? To actually look and tell us how much time you spend on that. That's not here, but we'll get to that. We also ask them, do you enjoy that part of your job? And are you effective at it? And what's fascinating to us is if you're driving for effectiveness on that first row, hybrid work and always in person, pretty darn close, right? So, um, but if you're driving for joy, which by the way, you should, because it lowers attrition, and even if people are not quitting, right, because they're worried about finding a new job, you don't want them to quit in their head, right? The quiet quitting. You want them to like be motivated and want to be there, right? So if you're solving for not just effectiveness, but you're solving for joy, in the top row, it tells you it's hybrid, right? Um, we also ask at the bottom, and I saw a question, um, you know, on in the chat about who makes the decision, right? And you know. Team, like, is it come from the top, top down mandate? Is the team deciding together or is it the individual decides, which is a little bit of um, chaos? And you could see very, you know, a top down mandate and a team driven decision, same for effectiveness. Um, but for joy, again, team driven, right? And so to me, I'm hoping this puts to bed the working model is for office space workers is team driven hybrid. Now, as Rob showed in his numbers earlier, we're mostly at hybrid now. That's good. But look where the decisions are coming. They're coming from the top, the bottom left. Not so joyful. Okay. So um, so hopefully that puts that to bed. If you flip to the next side, this is where we put in um, 
well, actually, so we ask people how much time they spend. I, I guess I pulled that slide out, but how much time they spend with the different tasks. And we find that they spend, individual contributors spend a day and a half a week on average on soul sucking administrative work. It, it's like the lowest joy you could get. Um, and managers spend a day a week on it, right? Managers and executives. So this is really important to us because there's not a company out there that is not looking at how to apply generative AI and AI to their work practices. And so our message is be very careful when you apply Gen AI to work. You don't want to have it take the stuff that gives your employees joy and take that away from them and leave them with the stuff that is just soul sucking. But if you point the Gen AI and the interventions at the soul sucking work, the admin, which was low joy on all of the charts on the page before, um, their satisfaction with work goes up. So I thought this was a fascinating slide. So basically, you know, the number in the middle is how satisfied overall are you with work? And for people who use Gen AI regularly for admin chart, uh, admin tasks, and if you could go back quickly to the slide before, you could see um, the admin to the right of every circle, that's the lowest joy score there is. You get no joy out of admin work, okay? So if you flip back to that slide, it's telling you that's the place you be, should be pointing your Gen AI interventions. And when you do, um, overall satisfaction goes up. I will leave it there and pass to my friend, Nick. Okay, that, thanks very much, Debbie. Um, thanks, Rob. Um, why don't we go to the, uh, you know, nobody likes looking at their own photo, so let's go to the next slide, please. So um, this came about, in fact, you know, from talking to Debbie, Rob, Brian, a whole bunch of folks. I talked to a lot of folks, senior HR execs, and they just kept saying the same question, asking the same thing. Has an HR become a bigger deal? And the answer is yes, very clearly. So this is a graph which shows, well, why don't you step back? If you're a publicly listed company, what you put out, you put out quarterly accounts and you know annual accounts, 10Ks, 10Qs. You also put out something called the DEF 14A statement. Very boring, probably most people don't look at it, but it lists the top five paid execs, the singularly most important five executives in the company. And we've looked at that and we got that data for the S&P 1500 going all the way back to 1992. And the question is, how many of those top five paid execs, the most important executives in the company, sat in HR? And the answer is, if you go back to 1992, effectively none. You're looking at only half a percent of companies had an HR person in it. If you look, you can see by 2022, it's gone up to 13 percent. And, you know, if you squint, I would say that slope is, if anything, getting steeper over time. So it feels like HR is not only rising in importance, it's rising in importance at an accelerating rate. So the question is why, and from talking just to tons of folks, in fact, I had Laszlo Block come in and talk to my class about three, four weeks ago on this. If you go back to the early 90s and the 80s and before, a lot of HR seemed to be around compliance, you know, payroll, pensions, benefit, uh, tax, et cetera. It still is there, but there's a huge additional component now that's critical to CEOs, CFOs, things like, you know, as we've been discussing, work from home policies, which affect real estate, which affects strategy, affects the age of your employees, affect, you know, recruitment and retention. Things like DEI, COVID, the lockdowns, um, you know, Me Too, various issues that have become very central to companies. And so HR execs are now sitting on the top board have become much more critical. So next slide, thanks. So what's going on? Who are these people? Um, well, we also look at the titles. There are really four ways to break the titles out, maybe two of the most obvious. One is, do they have the word chief in the name? Is that like, you know, a big sounding title or do they have something that in corporate speaks a little bit less senior? Turns out that the titles have also had an upgrading. So if you look what used to be the case, if they existed, these top five execs, they were typically called like a vice president or something that didn't have chief in front of it. In the last 10 years, chief human resource officer and chief people officer have really taken over. So those are roles that have become a big deal in companies. We also look at their pay and their pay is also going up. So everything shows very much um, the rise of HR over the last 30 years. Next slide, thanks. 
So where does it come from? You know, I was like initially thinking in the research is why having the data is great. I initially thought, well, this is all just tech. Like tech has become a big deal and it's no surprise. Turns out that's completely wrong. So uh, if you look, this shows the share of firms with the top five paid exec in HA by industry. And tech sits in, you know, this Standard & Poor's calls that information. It's in the middle. So it's probably below average. So it's definitely not tech. Finance is kind of low. What is going on? It's professional business services, leisure, hospitality, wholesale, retail. These are like very mainstream industries that have decided over the years, people as in human capital is becoming more and more important. And you need an exec that's running human capital called HR. And they, you know, what we see is things like chief operating officers slowly slipping down the ranks is being replaced by chief human resource officer, chief people officer. Next slide, thanks. The other thing I thought, well, is maybe it's smaller companies. Again, we were totally wrong. Turns out you're much more likely to have a top five paid HR exec if you're a big company. So this is by employment. You can do it by sales. You can do it by market value. It's all very similar. So what you should have in mind is take one example. Just a concrete example is McDonald's. So McDonald's, one of the biggest companies in the world, uh, one of their top five paid execs on their DEF 14A statement is Heidi Kaposi. She's uh, you know, head of human resources. So this seems to be the future. You know, I see this line keep going up, but for anyone in HR, I'm pretty sure this must be filtering down and HR just becoming a much more central role in companies as people and human capital becomes more important to businesses. Okay, I'll stop. Thanks. Awesome. We covered a lot of ground. Nick, I'm going to go right back to you with a question that I think is a pretty good one. Um, why are we talking about HR? How, what's the relationship to flexible work in your mind? And kind of like, why is this such an important, um, why is this happening in tandem with some of the things that we're seeing in the world at the moment? Um, well, I mean, as you and Debbie spoke about the, the flex discussion, I mean, I've, the last four years, I've had so many discussions with execs, particularly corporate boards. And a lot of times these discussions has been, you know, like a classic conversation has come up maybe 30, 40 times as a CEO saying, why are we having all this work from home stuff and we're not saving an office space? And, they, you know, they'll look at like the head of real estate and look at, you know, X in the corner and the head of real estate is like, I can't do anything about it. It's basically what I call the hybrid squeeze. Everyone's coming into work on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're at home Monday, Friday. You can't reduce office space. And then they'll look and turn at the H head of HR and say, you explain it. And ultimately, a lot of these questions just land at the feet of HR. And in fact, interestingly, real estate has been moving within companies from being a CFO thing about leases and, you know, very dry kind of finance things to under HR. And so this is why it all connects up. I mean, another issue is age of your employees. So it turns out folks in their 20s are kind of keen on coming in typically three, four days a week. But once you hit 30 plus, people really want some flexibility. If you're a company that wants to hire 30 plus year olds, which you know is pretty critical for mid-year senior management, you're going to have to have some flexibility. I'd also add, I know you didn't ask me, but that's okay. I was about um, to actually, so it's great that you jumped in. <laughs> you know, I've been looking at this with um, my, my team in our Henderson Institute. Um, it's fascinating to look at the trend in jobs per, open jobs per job seeker. And if you take um, COVID out, it's a straight line right up. So there are more and more jobs looking for less and less workers. You know, in the US and some companies, it's over one, right? And that's assuming a perfect match, right? So if you actually think about the matching of skills, it's much higher. But even countries where there are still more job seekers than there are jobs, it's going to be, you know, more and more jobs open. The trend is going up. So Nick, your analysis on CHROs or chief people officers getting more money totally makes sense because the need operationally to attract and retain and motivate your people um, is getting harder and harder. So you need better and better um, people officers. Makes sense to me. It's also the capstone, I feel like, on a, on a trend that's been happening for decades now of um, HR moving away from a more compliance company protecting function and increasingly strategic, whether it be in the way we think about engaging talent or now the relationship between talent and real estate too. Uh, I feel like the the dimension and qualifications and requirements around that role have, have evolved pretty dramatically over the last 10 to 20 years too. 
All right, looking at other questions. Do you have any stats regarding differences in age groups as regards desire to work in the office or structured uh, hybrid environment? Nick, I think you've done some work on this, if I recall, in terms of different ages and where they want to be working. Am I, am I correct? In yeah, so I, I have two very different ways of looking at it, give you exactly the same answer. So one is surveying people. So is Sway, we survey 10,000 people a month. We've got, I don't know, 200,000 responses by now. And it's and the other is actually the gusto data. We look at how far people live from the office. And that's kind of the inverse, effectively, of days work from home. In both cases, you see people in their 20s seem to want to come in the office typically three, four days a week. They're younger. They kind of want to learn face to face. They want to socialize. And also the homes aren't great. You know, there's like five of them sharing an apartment in New York and no one really wants to work from home in their bedroom. When you look at 30s, 40s, they are more keen on working from home. Typical preferences are only come in two days a week in that group. Then you get up to 50, you know, I'm 50. You get, I, I'm in that bucket now, that 50 plus group. They look like they're increasingly keener on a, a mix. It's hard to know in the 50 plus. I suspect part of it is just, ex, you know, kind of their experience. Look, they've worked for 30 years. They're used to coming in. A lot of it's also their empty nesters. But it is very clear that if you take a 22 year old versus a 35 year old, they have really different preferences. And so, depending on who you're after, that should really affect your strategy. The thing that makes life complicated, by the way, when you talk to companies, is the 22 year olds come or 23 year olds coming because they want to be, you know, part of it is they want to be mentored and trained by someone above them. But that someone above them has to come in to do that. So, a lot of companies I speak to have this real problem. They'll say, yeah, I get the 20 somethings in, but their managers in their 30s and 40s don't want to come in as many days. And I have this kind of tension trying to uh, fit them together. I'm going, to, I'm going to shift to a different topic in here. There's actually a number of questions around days of week and how do we think about Monday, Friday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, real estate implications is a topic I spent a lot of time thinking about also. I'll start with one of the questions that Charlotte asked. Uh, can you talk about a why a company might mandate Monday to Friday in office? Do you see that becoming more common? Um, I'll share a little bit of what we see in our data around it and a couple of reasons. And then Nick, Debbie, if there's anything that, that you've seen, uh, please feel free to share. But I think there's a few reasons why a company might do this. Uh, one, the out of a desire to smooth some of the real estate consumption and not be too peaky, so to speak, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, some companies and teams might push toward one of those days needs to be a Monday or one of those days needs to be a Friday if there's some minimum, which actually spreads out usage a little bit and allows for real estate optimization. That's kind of one piece of it. The second is one of the worst experiences around an office is if you go in and nobody else is in the office. And so for the people and especially executives, if they like to be in on Monday or Friday, they might push for other folks to be in on a Monday or Friday so they don't feel like in their office alone. Those are a couple of things that we've seen or heard about. At the same time, Monday and Friday lag really meaningfully still behind Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in usage. When we look at companies with a specific days per week policy, meaning they require some specific days that's stipulated at the company level most commonly, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are generally in the 60 to 80% of companies with that type of policy mandate that day of the week. Monday, I think, is less than 30%. Friday is like 6%. Uh, so Friday effectively is a stipulated day has kind of died out as huge implications for central business districts and taxes and retail and a whole bunch of other things. We have not seen much movement against that over the last 12 months. Those numbers have stayed pretty flat. Nick, Debbie, I don't know if there's anything you'd add or anything you've seen there. Yeah, I mean, I think, and again, if you go back to the charts of maximizing for joy and effectiveness, um, team-driven decisions are incredibly important. And just to your point, you don't wanna be the only one there, right? Um, and so, and you saw when the individual decides, it's like neither maximizes for uh, uh, effectiveness or joy. And so I think you want the, a new muscle every team leader needs is how do you set the schedule and the rhythms and routines of your team? You didn't have to do it before COVID because you were all in, you didn't have to do it during COVID. For office workers because you're all home now you have to do it and you have to actually plan the work and the work activities so when you're together it's productive right the worst thing is the long commute to sit on zoom all day um and get interrupted when you're trying to do focus work and so um you know so for most of the days when you're really team driven work the team decides together and they should be deciding based on the work 
of the work, but also in their personal needs. And so Monday, Friday, you know, it's a lot easier to work, to shift in and out of the weekend working from home. And so you just tend to see that. Now, what that ignores is all the loose tie stuff. So, you know, and there's data I haven't run it, Nikki might have, or I've seen it where the connections between teams is still very tight regardless of the work model, but the connection to other people who are not on your team, the loose ties, the people you meet, you know, in the elevator or in the cafeteria, you know, you need to actually orchestrate that more and set fixed days for that. I happen to believe you don't need a fixed day per week for that. Maybe, you know, you see some fully remote companies saying a week, a quarter, um, where they get everyone all together, but you do need to solve for um, everyone's all in so you can get some loose ties coming. But again, that's not day per week dependent, again, except for Rob, what you said, right? Unless a senior leader likes that day. Yeah. I, go ahead, Nick, please. I, again, I had one other, you know, I totally on board with that. One interesting uh, thing is there's a company that one of my former students, MBA students, set up called Tandem. What it tries to do is pair companies that have offsetting days. So the wow. idea is, you know, I, I, I'm gonna do Monday, Tuesday, you're gonna do Wednesday, Thursday, I'll do Monday, Friday, you do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. There's two upsides. One is obviously you roughly half the office cost because you're only paying for it half the week. The other coming back to Debbie, what you were talking about, is it's a lot easier to organize it if there's only two days. Because the nightmare, people complain about, I, yeah, Rob's in on Monday, you're on a Tuesday, I'm on Wednesday. It's like no energy. Why did I come in to be on Zoom all day? If the office, if you've only got it for two days, it's pretty straightforward. You say, look, we just have the office Monday, Tuesday. Can you come in on those that's two right. days? Um, but yeah, that's like saying it's not my decision anymore. It's, you know, this is the days we've got it. But yeah, it, I mean, the other question is why Saturday and Sunday are closed? In some ways, this is an age old question. There are 168 hours in the week. Uh, even pre-pandemic, we only used roughly 50 of them, Monday to Friday, you know, kind of eight till six. Now we're using more like 30. It doesn't seem as extreme when you position it that way as thinking about the office is empty half the time. It was actually empty three quarters of the time before. It's now empty 80% of the time. It does change the way you think about pricing maybe a little bit though. Which yeah, exactly. Conversation. It's happening a lot. It's like having a car. The car, our cars sit out in the driveway unused, you know, 23 and a half hours of the day, but you still mostly have your own car. Yeah, one question that came in here that I thought was interesting uh, just on this topic of days and then we'll kind of move on to other, other pastures is... Yeah, there's a question, and you alluded to this a little bit, Nick, around if it's very peaky on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, that leads to some office optimization, uh, maybe not as much as it would be if it was more spread out through the course of the week. As I mentioned, there's huge impacts on central business districts in terms of what does that mean for the future, the tax base, retail, et cetera. Um, what are you seeing? Are, there, are you being asked to advise companies on how to think about this and spread out peak? Or is it just Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday seem to be where a lot of companies are naturally gravitating, even when those days aren't mandated? I'm curious of any perspective on this. You, as you said earlier, Friday, Friday, don't try and get people in on Friday. They just, it like, basically pisses them off so much. So generally, Friday is just a dead day. So then you're down to four days a week. And if you're Disney, say you just have people come in on all four days. If you're going to have less, there is a trade-off between, as you said, scheduling, but and effectively using office space. You know, team A, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Team B, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, etc. That model does use the office space effectively, but the problem is, you know, teams don't overlap. You've got to have clear desks. You know, some people have to come in on Friday. So most companies I talk to still at this stage are saying we care more about the company and individuals connecting together and being in on the same days. So we're just going to take the hit, have the office empty Monday, Friday, and have people say come in on three days or on two days. The alternative is just to get rid of your office altogether. So going back to flexible, look, if you're only meeting one day a week or less, why not just abandon the office and just hire it as needed? You know, that's that's the other way around it. And you can do a fun place that you meet, you know, once a month, and it's a different office. You can just go out and hire it uh, and just, you know, have some variety. So I would say if you're one day or less or a week or less, just get rid of your office entirely. Can I build on Nick, what you said? Like, again, we're only talking about office space workers. They're 20, 30, maybe in the U S 40% of the workforce, but 60 to 80% of the global workforce can't do all the things we're talking about. And the win-win I dream about is 
Um, actually, when people need to get together on teams, you get together with the front line. You do it at a manufacturing plant. You do it in a retail center. You put it in a distribution center. You do it in a hotel. Because COVID has forced the gap between you know, what people call white collar and blue collar, but, you know, office workers and deskless frontline workers to be wider and wider and wider and more disconnected and more disconnected, which is not just good for morale, but understanding the operations you serve. Um, so I'll take your idea one step further and say, don't even rent a WeWork, like go out to a plant, meet in a conference room there, see what the real conditions are like, do a Gemba walk, talk to people. Deb, Debbie, I want to come back to you on a couple on a, on a theme that I'm going to tie together from a few questions here that I thought were interesting. Um, there's a couple of comments around motivating or broadly motivating or, or kind of like what what the value or reward is that you get for being in the office more. And some people think about it in terms of a hot desk versus a dedicated desk and any trends around if you come in two days or three days a week, you know, does that start to happen or um, what motivates folks broadly to kind of like want to come into the office? Part of the reason why I want to ask you is because you've done such good work around different folks and who wants to be working at home for certain things versus working in the office. And how do you manage through that? Maybe if you could share a little bit about some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think um, if you step back from the which days, which groups, what do you do when you get there? Is it right? Like real estate, flex, whatever. I think if you take a step back and you think about um, you know, what do employees want, right? Um, like they want to enjoy work. That's why we measure, you know, the joy piece of it. They want to enjoy work. And, you know, there are some that have a functional need to be in the office, right? I don't have a house I could work from. My kids are too loud. It's not safe. I have too many roommates. Like some are extroverts and need to be around people, you know, and so there are lots of different personal reasons to go in. There are team related reasons. OK, we're going to do collaborative work these days, you know, so we go in. Um, but but my my point is, like, you need to step back and think about employees and what they want. And when you do that, you will start to see needs that don't correlate necessarily with demographics, right? The things I mentioned, like their personal circumstances, it's their neuro, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, right? And so it's not just age and gender and caregiver status, but um, so the overall message I talk a lot about is you need to start to think of your employees like customers. So if you follow the logic, right? There are more jobs than employees looking for jobs if you're assuming the perfect fit, right? Um, and so most organizations are very, very smart when they talk to their customers, right? They do the ethnography and the deep discovery and the segmentation and the personalization and the design thinking and the customer journeys and all those kinds of things. But we're not that smart when we think about our employees and we're trying to address it with a one size fits all poor solution we just keep showing with more data and more data and more data this is a poor solution to tell everyone exactly how to get their work done but we need to start thinking more in a segmented way which may correlate with demographics but actually there's more than demographics that drive that and the good news is rob that most organizations have those skills to start thinking more sophisticatedly about what the different segments of employees need to be their best every day, um, to be effective and enjoy work every day. So we need to start turning them on that. And then you'll see, okay, well, there are these segments that really want to be in. There are these segments that don't. And we could be a lot more sophisticated about it. Unfortunately, I think we're a long way from that. Debbie, I'm going to come back to you with one other point. Um, someone asked, are any of the hosts, uh, three of us, plotting overall company performance versus in-office hybrid remote arrangements? And so you and I have done some work on that. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about some of the, the findings we've had there. Yeah, and I think we've shared them on this call before, but knowing not everyone attends every call, and even if you do, you don't remember. But I think we shared, Rob Wright, our data that showed for companies that are more flexible, they from a financial perspective, showed greater revenue growth between 2020 and 2022, where we did the analysis, the time period we did the analysis, and those who were more um, full-time in, 
right, had lower revenue growth. And even when you look at hybrid, those who were fully flex, you know, more flexible in hybrid had greater revenue growth than those who were structured hybrid. So from, if I'm remembering it right, so from a um, financial performance using revenue growth as a proxy, um, it, it reinforces what we continue to say again and again. Nick, have you done any work in that area yet? Anything on performance yet or in terms of kind of like linkage of model with performance? Um, probably the cleanest thing, I mean, there's a lot of survey stuff. Broadly, hybrid seems to be net zero in productivity. Um, fully remote is all over. The, I mean, there's quite there's maybe 10, 20 research studies. Fully remote is all over the place. So it's like some are my, finding minus 40 if you sent people home, you know, at a rush at the beginning of the pandemic, others plus 10 if it's really well managed, really motivated, etc i mean the i think the best piece i have is something that's hopefully about to come out of nature which is we did a randomized control trial on 1600 grads and we randomized them by even an old birthday so if you're born on you know the second fourth six eighth of the of the month you have to come in five days and if you're born on an odd day like the third fifth seventh you had to you got to work from home wednesday friday so it's really testing hybrid versus five days in the office uh, what did we find? This is in a company called Trip.com. So it's a big tech company, big kind of standard, big corporate. Uh, we found no impact on performance at all, like none. We had lines of code written, promotions, performance reviews, the text, absolutely nothing. The only result we found was people that were allowed to work from home two days a week, their quit rates fell by a third. And for the company, this was like, well, it's really expensive. Every person that quits, we have to re-recruit -re -re and retrain them up. They estimate it was thirty, forty thousand dollars per quit. So they were like, "This is a no-brainer. It's way more profitable having hybrid." So the stuff I've seen basically shows that hybrid and flexible for some roles are significantly more profitable, and it's why Rob and your data that's become dominant. I mean, we live in a capitalist economy. Stuff that makes businesses money tends to stick, and hybrid and flexible is just more profitable. A question from uh, from Denise, you know, I'll, I'll give this back to to Debbie. What types of flexibility have you studied for the 60 to 80 percent of employees who do not work at desk jobs? Yeah, uh, you know, what you. is novel or trending there? Yeah. So first of all, and this is I see Brian's on and helping answer questions, which is always awesome. Brian, thank you. Um, um, we looked at it in Future Forum in our research there, and we found um, even with office workers, they value flex in time more than flex in place. And so when you start thinking about flexibility, you can then start to experiment um, in you know, deskless or frontline jobs uh, with flexing time. And you see movements towards shift marketplaces where people can trade shifts, moving the shifts. Um, I talked to a company um, where we're actually writing a case study uh, with a professor at HBS where they move to um, a whole flex workforce. So bring back retirees, um, people who were formerly incarcerated, students with much more flexible schedules in addition to augment because of this labor shortage issue, right? To bring them in. So to do flex there as well. But I would say if you're defining flexibility, right? Then that's the answer saying people want flexibility, but there really are two levels to the question when people say they want flex. One is they really do want flex, right? You have dogs, you have kids, you have a long commute, you really do want flex, you're an introvert, whatever. But you're also saying, don't be the boss of me and tell me where to work. You trusted me before COVID, you trusted me during COVID, all of a sudden you're telling me to show up. What they're really asking for is trust and respect and accountability. Um, and if you elevate the question to that, man, there are things you could do for factory workers and distribution centers, right? Like in terms of trust and respect and recognition and making them feel valued and supported. And there's a whole host of things you could do there as well. Nick, any other interesting titles you're seeing popping up, like chief employee experience officers, future of work, anything else that you've been tracking or, or watching? There? Yeah, I, I saw that thing. Um, we basically search for the word, you know, human people, uh, employee. So yes, the chief people officer, chief human resource officer, the big two, but as you know, with American companies are very creative with other titles. So we do our best. There's only one that, you know, only in inverted commas, 1,500 of them. So 
but those, those are the big two uh chief people officers like on a tear i mean that's the one that's uh rising the fastest i don't know why maybe that's shorter than chro but the thing i notice is mainly it's chief titles are replacing vice presidents and other stuff they're kind of getting up titled as well as uh up rolled i wonder if part of it too is that the the term human resources while still fairly commonly used is it maybe a bit of a a more a, a less emotional or a less feeling term in terms of like how do you think about your people than you know, people itself and so i wonder if some of it is even just the branding uh, of that role and how we think about employees within an organization that's probably true yeah we could look at the we could look at the variation the other thing <clears throat> i didn't show actually was we look at the pay of them relative to the other non-co exec so ceos are on a different level forget them take you know there's five of them one's the ceo the other you know how's their pay compared to the other three turns out at the beginning of the sample they're about 40 percent, which is an enormous pay gap so even if you made the top five you're always the worst paid now they're about 65 percent of them so it's still below but the pay is also catching up as well i want to share one other thought that i was interesting there was a there was a comment around you know nick you had made the comment around uh, real estate moving around a little bit and sometimes still being in the finance organization, sometimes now moving into the HR organization. Um, someone had said it's interesting also about how IT reports into that part of the organization increasingly. You know, it, it strikes me one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently and curious if, if either of you two have a perspective is uh, the the evaluation for criteria for real estate leaders has changed quite a bit over time. And, and HR leaders, I think, traditionally are very used to having to bring data to the discussion. You want to change comp? What's the benchmark or data? You want mm -hmm. to uh, you want to change benefits? Okay, well, what are our peers doing? Like that's kind of the operating model for HR traditionally, um, and real estate somewhat like that. But real estate was kind of an expected cost. It was a function of how many people you had and, and square footage and growth. And and now all of a sudden, how much space do we need? How should that space be allocated? Where should it be? Much more complex questions. And in some ways, HR is a little bit more oriented to bringing the data in that way and what others are doing than real estate folks are and and bringing those folks closer together to think through some of that stuff i think is pretty interesting i'm curious if that's kind of crossed your radar screen at all or if that's part of your your thought process on that collaboration too uh, did, debbie did you want to no go ahead go ahead uh, um yeah i mean yes the, the traditional hr thing was like price per square foot and then uh, financing those are the two metrics that you know there are other metrics I think actually it's a lot of like forward looking rather than backward looking. In some senses, it's the metrics are now, you know, looking five, 10 years out. How many people are going to be here? Which days are they coming? It's a lot harder. So it's no longer about grinding out some great lease rate on some, you know, 12 year loan, et cetera. It's much more about a bigger picture. Are we going to be hybrid? Are we going to be flexible? Are we even going to have an office? I mean, there's also... A lot of company, you know, like Gable, I'm working with space aggregators that basically sell you desks by the day. And so a bunch of companies are like, we're going to keep office offices in, you know, I don't know, San Francisco, but our Denver office, we're just going to get rid of and just buy space as we need it. So that is a decision that was not even there before. So the dimensions of what you're looking at have gone from two dimensions, price per square foot and financing to like 15. And so it's just a much harder question. So yes, data. I also just think it's why you need to involve multiple parties because if you said, look, we're actually going to expand in Asia, that kind of affects how many people you need on the West Coast, say, versus the East Coast, which then feeds into real estate. Great point. Debbie, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, and maybe just an observation on this and, and maybe the broader discussion, which is we are fundamentally, we have and we are fundamentally rethinking what work looks like. And the whole world was built up around one model of you commute, you're in person, <laughs> you go home and we're redesigning it. And I, I've said this a lot, like um, that's hard to do. Like imagine right when we went from mainframe to cloud, you didn't just issue a policy from the C-suite and expect it to happen. You needed new metrics and new measurement and new data and new enablement and new investments. And so when it comes to rethinking how work is done, when, where, and how, um, we need to invest in a ton of new capabilities, Nick, to your point on all different metrics and all different ways of measuring. We shouldn't expect the old ways to work. And so it's a little naive to, for leaders to think you could write a memo 
and have worked totally reinvented and have great results, which is also, by the way, not related to that question. When people say, oh, hybrid work's not working, I have the data that shows, and you say, well, what's the data? Well, no one's showing up. Okay, well, that's not really the data to show it's not working. Or even people are not productive, whatever productive is. Um, you're like, well, what did you do to invest to try and make them productive? What did you do to build the capabilities? I saw a comment that I couldn't agree with more about building muscles for leaders to inspire, motivate, develop, connect with distributed teams, you know, building the muscle to set days per week and manage the real estate around it, right? So if you try hybrid without investing to make it work, right? Anyhow. And maybe one point of clarification, I think there was a question around the productivity. I have not seen, Nick, tell me if you've seen otherwise, I haven't seen any studies that have said that hybrid work is less productive than full-time and office work. I think I think the hybrid work scores, I think, have been pretty consistent. I think the fully remote scores have been a, a little bit across the map, right? Like some studies have said it's better. Some have said not so good. Anything in between. Is that is that your understanding yeah, yeah, totally well right. in terms of data? So, I mean, I'll give you two. One is there are a few hybrid things they generally find flat to, if anything, positive. The fully remote, there's a huge variance. And the reason is it depends how well managed it is. The other thing to step back is just look at aggregate US productivity growth. So the US has done very well since 2020. And that's despite having a global pandemic. I mean, you, if you were to tell me in 2019 that we're going to have a global pandemic, you know, a million people die, we're going to have lockdown, all the horrors that came with it, and productivity growth accelerated, I'd be like, something amazing has to have happened to offset it. And I think that's honestly work from home. So the aggregate data is also really supportive that work from home has been positive for productivity. And that picks up on stuff that's missed on the company by company study. So to be clear, if I go fully remote, I vacate that office, someone else can use it. Where if I'm not driving, I'm not clogging up the roads. So the firm by firm studies actually miss some stuff you get picked up in the aggregate data. Yeah. And I would say I've heard the and seen the productivity argument for individual companies, Rob. So not more aggregate, but I've seen some who say, listen, we were initially productive during COVID, but now that we're hybrid, we're losing that. And I'm like, well, why are you losing it? Are you investing in making it work or are you letting yourselves lose it? Got it. That's a, that's an important clarification. It makes a lot of sense. And, and look, one of the things, Debbie, that you've said to me a lot, which I which I believe in, I think bears repeating now, is companies have operated full time in office for uh, time immemorial, right? Like we've operated in these more hybrid models for you know a few years. And and yes, to be clear, there were some organizations or teams that experimented with this stuff and did this prior to the pandemic. But for most organizations, the vast majority of their experience with this type of operating model has come in the last couple of years. And just like any other technology, the evolution of best practices and how we manage through that, um, how we build culture in that way, leaders that will have then grown up or companies that have grown up in those types of models uh, will all lead to, or technology also getting better for to support that, uh, will all lead to kind of like that model improving over time. So if anything, I think it's, uh, we're still in the early days of, of how effective those models will be as they start to mature. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we are just about at time. Uh, Nick, Debbie, uh, very appreciative. You both are incredibly insightful as always. I think we covered a lot of ground. Thank you to everybody that joined us. Uh, really good questions. And I think we, we talked about a lot of really interesting topics. Um, as we said on the front end, uh, we will share a link to the recording. It will go both on the Flex Index site. It will also be in our weekly newsletter next week. We'll also share a link to the slides in case anybody's interested in seeing the slides. If you have any questions, things you want to hear us talk about next time, areas of interest for study, whatever it might be, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll see if we can't weave it in, and we'll do it again in a quarter. Thanks for having As you could tell, we could talk about this stuff forever. So thanks for orchestrating us so well, Rob. Yeah, thanks very much. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.